Diamonds. Diamantes. A man's best friend. No, wait a minute. Maybe that's a dog. Anyways, over the next few lectures, we're going to talk about diamonds going from stuff we know, like the four C's, to other aspects, like where they come from in the earth, both geographically and geologically. Most of the time, I'm going to use images from the Smithsonian, showing the the crown jewels of the United States. In this example, here's some of the best stones from the Smithsonian, including a 203 karat colorless stone down to these fancy colors where they're much smaller, like this one's just 5.1 carats. But they're worth a huge amount of money because that fancy color is so rare. And we're going to talk about how these colors come to be. To start off, let's go with, we're going to start out here with a graph. And the graph is going to be a production graph versus time. All right, so this is production. And this is like carats per year. And for thousands of years, diamonds were coming primarily from India, like from the 4th century BC is when there's some record of diamonds being produced there. And our production levels were exceptionally low, maybe thousands of carats per year. India maintains being the world's primary source of diamonds until around uh, sometime in the mid um early 1700s, maybe around 1730, there are diamonds discovered in Brazil. We're going to mark Brazil here. And then Brazil takes over as the world source, and the production goes up a little bit. And so Brazil is the main source then for 150 years until 1890, or thereabouts, 1870 to 1890, let's say, when there are reports in South Africa of gems being found not only in alluvial environments, but also out of primary volcanic kimberlite deposits. Well, production really starts to take off. More and more discoveries are occurring throughout other areas of Africa, like Congo and Angola and Namibia. And so this production level is rising through those years. Well, in the 1960s, it starts to go exponential because diamonds are discovered in Russia. And then in 19... 90s diamonds are discovered in Australia and then in around 2000 diamonds are discovered in Canada and production is incredible and today we are producing 150 million carats I mean that's a number that starts to not even make sense right of diamonds every year that's the equivalent of around 30 tons of diamonds are pulled out of the ground every year that doesn't seem like there should be enough rarity and supply problems to um, cause any high prices. But there's reasons, economic drivers, for all of that. Anyways, that's some of the background. Let's go to more background now under the idea of just the science of mineralogy of diamonds. Mineralogy of diamonds. Compositionally, diamond is as simple as it gets. The composition is pure carbon. Well, almost pure carbon. The beautiful colorless diamond here, that might be an essentially a pure crystal of diamond made only oh, don't have that, of carbon. And as it bonds, it has a very dense structure. We're going to draw the structure over here. It ends up having a charge of, um, or like a, what do we want to say here, where every carbon can bond to four carbons. So to do that, it makes this kind of tetrahedral shape. So here's a carbon, there's a carbon. Here's a carbon, and here's a carbon, all right? So this is supposed to kind of look like a pyramid. And then every single one of these carbons can bond to four more carbons. So this carbon would come down and bond to a little red setup. So let's just draw a red setup here. That goes here, that goes here, that goes here. Uh -huh. And we're starting to build a framework. And this carbon right here will bond to another tetrahedral shape right here. And this one would actually share there. You can even show it sharing. And then this will go here, and this will go here. All right, do you see the framework that we're starting to build? This one now is kind of more towards the front. So this will come down here, bond, and it will go to this one, and it would also go to this one, and it'll make its own here. This is the framework for diamond. And what you can start to see is this kind of pyramidal shape that's starting to build. And that's going to matter for its crystal structure. We're going to talk a little bit about other things that occur with the composition of carbon. One that's going to really matter later is that trace elements are possible. 
that are occurring at the PPM level. All right, so we're going to put PPM, where you can substitute out, let's say, one of these carbons. And, oh, let's see, we could do this. We could go here. And then instead, in that spot, you could stick a nitrogen, for example. That's what I mean by um, having a substitution. So these are going to be trace elements. Things like nitrogen are possible. Boron is another one that will occur. They didn't know that the that diamond was pure carb carbon until around 1772, which to me seemed fairly late. Someone used a magnifying glass. They put a diamond in. This is kind of a cool story. The scientist put a diamond. Here's our diamond inside of a jar. He sealed the jar and then used a magnifying glass to burn. Okay, to burn the diamond. After it combusted, they measured what was inside. It just completely disappeared. It didn't turn to anything else. It just disappeared. Well, what ended up happening was the stuff inside the vial was CO2. And so that's how they were able to deduce, deduce that diamond is pure carbon. It's the exact same composition as graphite or charcoal. That They're also just made of carbon. But the crystalline structure is so different with this very densely packed tetrahedra. This moves us into crystallography. So B is going to be crystallography of diamond. With Roman numeral or little one, we're going to say that it is crystallizes in the isometric system. This is the system, remember, that has fantastic symmetry. And the shape that diamond will crystallize as is almost always an octahedron. We'll call that the, the form or crystal habit. It can also crystallize as a cube. That's less common. And right here, what I want to do is take a moment with you and draw an octahedron. So to do this, we have to draw some triangles. And your triangles can be better than mine, right? Because I'm doing this on a screen. We want to do this in three dimensions. So there's our top part of our triangle, our bottom part of our triangle. All right. And then we need to do the three dimensionality. So go here to here to here. There's our octahedron. Now to make this look more 3D, what we're going to do in all of our sketches is we're going to put like little dotted lines in the background to show what it looks like on the other side. All right, so if you do something like that, you have drawn a decent octahedron. In fact, well, now that you've done that, why don't I actually show you a couple? These are both images from the Smithsonian. Here's one where we have an octahedron occurring within the matrix that it came to the Earth's surface in, which is called a kimberlite. We'll talk about that later. But you can see that this is the raw crystal coming out of the ground. It is an octahedron. You can see that shape. Now, here is probably the, this is the biggest diamond at the Smithsonian. Let me, uh, that's too big. We've made it too big here. Oh my gosh. Shrink that down. This is called the Oppenheimer diamond. We're going to use this, um, to just demonstrate some things, it is a 253 carat raw diamond. What makes that very unusual is that usually diamonds this size and this clean and clear, you can see right through it, have um, been cut. It ends up being one and a half inches tall, just so you can think about what size this is. This is a big stone. And you can see that it roughly shows the shape of an octahedron, but they're starting to be kind of where the sharp edge is here. See how that's kind of rounded off? Well, that's one of the form things that happens as the diamond's on its way to the surface. It crystallizes an octahedron, but what will start to happen is that dissolution occurs. And when dissolution occurs, we're gonna draw something here. Oh gosh, let's do it down here below. We're gonna draw dissolution of the octahedron. So we're gonna put a little three here. And we're going to say dissolution of octahedron produces dodecahedron. And we often see, we're going to say produces dodecahedron. Dodecahedron is 12 sided. And to draw a 12 sided shape will challenge me right now, but I'm going to be willing to fail in front of you. The faces on a dodecahedron are these diamonds. So this is the front. Let's see if I can do this. If you want to, you could pause the video and go look up a dodecahedron shape and then see if you can draw it better than I can right now. But let's see. So this is a diamond. And then we have to draw a couple more diamonds. 
There's a diamond. Oh boy, this is getting real sloppy. And we got another diamond. We gotta go down here. Oh, we're almost there now. Might as well keep going. There. Oof, that is terrible, terrible. What I'm going for, guys, is a dodecahedron, a 12-sided shape. Uh, this is an example of, in real life, of a dodecahedron. You can at least see where I'm going from. Here's these diamond shapes, right? Diamond shapes that end up making this 12-sided figure. Well, how did this relate to the octahedron via dissolution? Maybe I can show that here because we can draw the octahedron. Right, there's our octahedron. Again, messy, messy. And if you start to dissolve every corner, every edge, right? Dissolve that edge, dissolve that edge, dissolve that edge. And as they erode away, you can start to get these flat sides. So like if, if you take this side away and start to kind of make it flattened, you're getting this face here. And if you start to flatten this face here, well, then you're getting this face here. So like, so like this is one, this is two. Uh -huh. So this used to be an octahedron, but it dissolved during eruption. So that's one of the important aspects of the crystallography of diamond is that octahedrons and dodecahedrons are related, and those are the type of crystals that you find. Let's see, what to move on to next? Well, one thing that we see on the surfaces of these diamonds are called trigons, and they're also forming via dissolution. So we're going to say another dissolution feature are trigons. These are very common on the surface of diamonds. Trigons are common dissolution features. What does a trigon look like? Well, what we're going to do is I'm going to zoom in to one of the faces of the huge Oppenheimer diamond. And when we zoom in to that face, this is what we see. We see these small triangles, three-dimensional triangles as pits that go down into the crystal. And that's what a trigon is. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw, what's going on here? <clears throat> here we go. All right. No computer glitching allowed. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a diamond. All right, it's octahedral. Not all the lectures are going to be quite as drawing heavy. All right, here it is in 3D. We can do our dotted lines to make it look 3D. There we go. And what trigons do is they form on the faces, on these big faces right here. So this is where we're going to put a trigon. And the triangles always point in a specific way. They point to the middle. So these triangles, if there were trigons down in this bottom part, they would point upwards. And if there were trigons in this face, they would point downwards. So I want you to do that in yours, all right? Draw something like this. These are these triangular faces you see on raw diamonds. They point towards the center. We could say that, all right? Point towards center line. Well, that's about all we need to talk about with respect to the crystallography, except for one last part, which is a twinning, right? Remember twinning is a, um, an intergrowth of crystals. So twinning does occur in diamonds and it produces a shape. It produces a very triangular shape. Triangular shape gets produced and they're called mackles. When you see a flattened triangular shape, it's called a mackle. I'll put some mackles here up. Here's a picture. Um, oh, incidentally, this, this picture and this picture are not from Smithsonian. Instead, they are from a textbook called Tappert and Tappert. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list those as TT. Oh, that's not TT. TT is my reference for this picture and the picture above as well. That's the other source of pictures for this lecture. So mackles are these three-dimensional triangles, flattened triangles. Uh, we could draw one right here because you don't have that picture in your notes. How do we draw a three-dimensional triangle? Eh, that's good enough. Something like that. And to show, so what ends up happening is that this is the twin plane right here. That's the twin plane. And the way it happens, well, it's a little tricky, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a draw. 
we're going to make our octahedron. And then what we do, let's see, okay, we got to go 3D. At the very least, you're going to be good at drawing octahedrons by the time this lecture is over. If we put in a twin plane within this crystal that goes from here down to there, across there, let's see, it goes across here, comes down here, and then there. If we slice the crystal perfectly through like that and then rotate it, one piece around by 180 degrees, well, you end up taking your octahedron and you turn it into this triangular shape called a mackle. So we've got three main crystal shapes that are possible. We've got triangular mackles, we've got octahedrons, and we have dodecahedrons. Now, the next part of the notes in this section is going to be big C, and that's physical properties. And then we'll be done with mineralogy of diamonds. Our physical properties, well, you know the hardness, right? Everyone knows the hardness of diamonds. It's number 10 on Mohs scale. But one thing that's very interesting about diamond is that even though it's very tough, there is a problem with its survivability at times, and that is it has a very um, brittle cleavage. So we are going to say that Mohs of 10 makes this have fantastic survivability. So it is very good for survivability, but it does have a pronounced cleavage. And the cleavage can be perfect, and it's in the octahedral direction. So perfect octahedral is what we'll say here. What does that look like? Okay, draw your octahedron. At this point, you're probably faster at it than I am. Is that my best one yet? I don't know. Put in our three dimensionality. Okay. And then we're going to put in the cleavage plane. So if you were to, you've always heard you could cut a diamond may, maybe by another diamond or by hitting it with a hammer. Well, it's true. If you were to hit this with a hammer right here, you would detach a plane that would go through the stone like this and like this. And you could break off this whole fragment right here along this plane of weakness. So we're going to call that our cleavage plane there. And that's one way that diamonds are cut for jewelry, is by cleaving them along edges that they are on um, planes, sorry, we're going to call that a cleavage plane, that they want to break along. Now there is also a differential hardness to a diamond. It's not 10 every single way. In fact, this face right here, the octahedral surfaces, these are by far the hardest directions in a diamond. But there's other directions as well, right? There's the, so that's the octahedral direction, octahedral direction. We learned about the dodecahedral direction. That's these edges and corners. That's the dodecahedral. And then there's another direction as well. That's the cubic direction, which is across the crystal like this. So there's these three directions that you could work a diamond crystal on. And this one, the dodecahedral is very soft. I mean, it's still a 10, but this is the softest direction in the crystal. And eh, this one also is fairly soft. So if you want to saw or grind a diamond to create a jewelry, you'd want to take advantage of the cubic and dodecahedral directions, not the cleavage direction. Have we gotten too far in the weeds on that? Yes, of course we have. Now, the we're running, we're running out of time here. Our specific gravity and density of diamond is very high. For a colorless, light-looking gemstone, it doesn't have any iron in it. It's 3.52 grams per centimeter cubed. The reason for it is because it's so densely packed with that isometric structure. It's 1.6 times higher than that of graphite, even though the composition is the same, okay? And so the reason why it's so high is we're going to say because carbon packed so tightly. And what are some other facts? Oh, well, there's not too many other things. One that's kind of interesting is it has a very high thermal conductivity. So that means it absorbs heat very fast. So like if you were to put it on your tongue, it would feel like ice. Maybe that's why it is uh, referred to as ice in rap songs. Maybe not. I don't know at all. Another thing to put here is that it is chemically inert. So four and five is that it's chemically inert. It does not want to dissolve to make trigons or dodecahedrons unless you are in very hot conditions. And then here we're going to say high thermal conductivity. 
This is actually one of the ways you can test if your stone is diamond is by how quickly it pulls heat from something. It pulls heat. Feels like ice. All right, see you next time when we go into the geology.